Good evening and welcome to the Lopacon Township Planning Board meeting of February 24, 2016. At this time, I'd like to invite you to join us in a silent moment of prayer, followed immediately by the flag to, to salute to the flag of our country. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, I'm required to state that adequate notice of this meeting has been provided indicating the time and place of the meeting in accordance with Chapter 231 of the Public Laws of 1975 by advertising a notice in the Star Gazette and the Express Times and by posting a copy on the bulletin board in the municipal building. Beth, may I have a roll call, please? Member Scott? Here. Johnson? Yes. Jesse? Here. Stella? Breyer? Here. Wolf? Here. Mary McKay? Here. Vice Chairman Doral? Here. Chairman Van Vliet? Here. Fishback? Here. Here. The first order of business for the Planning Board uh, will be the appointment of the professionals. Um, the first resolution is number 16-02 to appoint the Tony Spizzaro, Anthony Spazzaro as our board, uh, Planning Board Attorney. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. I so I hear a second. Roll call that, please. Member Spots? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Wachuski? Yes. Breyer? Yes. Wolf? Yes. Mayor McKay? Yes. Vice Chairman Doral? Yes. Chairman Van Lee? Yes. Second appointment will be resolution number 16-3 to appoint George Ritter <coughs> of Regario and Plant as the planner for the planning board. Do I have a motion? Motion. Do I hear a second? Second. Roll call back, please. Members Fox? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Chesky? Yes. Pryor? Yes. Wolf? Yes. Mayor McKay? Yes. Vice Chairman Doral? Yes. Chairman Van Lee? Yes. Third resolution is to resolution 16-04 to appoint uh, Paul Sturbins of Mazer Engineering as the engineer for the board. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. So here a second. Second. Roll call back, please. Member Fox? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Pacheski? Yes. Pryor? Yes. Wolf? Yes. Mayor McKay? Yes. Vice <coughs> Chairman Doral? Yes. Chairman Van Blue. Yes. Thank you very much. Under old business, uh, has everyone received a copy of the minutes of the January 27, 2016 Planning Board meeting? Are yes. there any additions, corrections, comments? Hearing none, those minutes will stand as published. All right, we're moving on to new business this evening. Um, it's taking care of some house duties for the uh, planning board. Um, our first order of new business, after which we will move on to a joint session of the uh, Wapakon Township Council and the planning board. So, um, the I-78 Logistics Park General Development Plan application, Block 101, Lot 1, and Block 100, Lot 1, sometimes referred to as Block 101, Lot 1.01. 1 .01. Where's the applicant here? Yes, we are, Chairman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Carl Kim, law firm at Newman Scotland, and Diamond, the attorney for the applicant. Anybody want to agenda? I'd just like to confirm that uh, we have provided appropriate notice for 200 foot in all utilities as well as notice in the newspaper and um, can be confirmed that we have appropriate notice in uh, jurisdictional receipt this evening. And that's something we just state for the record. All right. Um, we're here for a, a general development plan for the property that everyone knows is the old Ingersoll Rand property, which is bordered by 22. Billisburg and Lepac Concrete in the neighborhood of 100 plus acres. Um, and 
if I just may, a general development plan, I'm not sure if this board hears them that often, many boards don't. It's something that is a little bit more than a conceptual review and something less than a site plan. It's sort of a hybrid of the two. Uh, the purpose of it is uh, for long-term planning for both the municipality as well as the applicant. It allows from the municipality's perspective to um, anticipate and absorb any additional municipal services that may be needed, impacts to the community, uh, everything varying for services such as garbage, police, um, traffic impacts, and the like. Uh, as well, it gives the applicant the ability to phase in a project over a number of years and lessen those impacts as opposed to building everything at one time or in a short period of time. Uh, as everyone's aware, the project is approximately 300 more acres in Phillipsburg. We have already been to Phillipsburg Planning Board, received our general development plan for phasing in that portion of the property. It is developed as a whole, um, which is having to be divided by a property line. So that's that's generally what a general development plan is, and of course they would defer to your council and plan if they have a different point of view because they're your professionals. The uh, professionals we have this evening to present the application to you is our um, engineer, Tom McGrath. We will have our traffic expert, Scott Kennel. We will have our um, planner and uh, economic um, advisor, Mr. Todd Poole, and then we will have Mr. Rob Larson, who is our professional planner, to give you planning testimony. Uh, we have received the reports from both of your professionals, and we will address those during the course of our testimony. Um, and as you may know, some of the waivers that are listed in there um, are also waivers from the uh, checklist. Um, the, uh, the board and the, the town, as most towns don't have a specific checklist for general development plans, so we had used the site plan checklist and a lot of things don't apply. So there's a few waivers that seem like there's a number of them. It's just, that, like I said, it's, it's not a site plan. Uh, we do, however, have to return to the board should you grant a general development plan for site plan approval for each and every part of the project as you would with any other project in your town. So again, this presents a general uh, oversight. You give us uh, input, we come back with the site plan. And we go through all the, the fine grain detail, the widths of roadways, sidewalks, the type of trees, location, all, all those, those fine grain details that we need to provide to you. Um, so uh, we do also look to the board for input for when we come back to site plan. Like I said, we don't get to that level of detail, but if there's something that you have seen in the plans and have a question about and would like us to address when we do come back for a site plan, please let us know. We will take notes and make sure we address that to you at that time. So the attorney has talked more than enough this evening. So I'm going to turn it over to our first um, expert, Mr. Thomas McGrath, and he's going to have to stand here by the microphone. So we're going to move the, the board over. So we apologize if anyone can't see it. Let us know. We'll turn it around. Mr. McGrath, uh, before you start with your presentation, um, we have a review of uh, what we, the checklist and the conceptual plan that you have there. I find it's lacking in quite a bit of information that we need before we can make a uh, decision on this right now. Um, we don't have any of the stormwater calculations that are required by our checklist. Uh, we're not looking for specifics, but at least for the general um, stormwater regulations. We have some questions about the environmental area here. We got a phone call late this afternoon indicating that we're bringing someone wanted to present more information on the environmental aspects of it. <clears throat> the uh, letter from the DEP saying the property was clear was for land, uh, soil only but that the water is still contaminated. You don't have clearance for that yet. So we're looking for a lot more information, especially on the traffic forecast that you're indicating for Route 22, the, uh, a little better general outline of what you're gonna do on the third street, what type of structure you're building there. And uh, generally, I mean, our traffic counts are at peak hours with between 700 and 1100, and you're indicating 63 to 93 or something like that in your traffic report that's here. So we find that that's extremely, you know, we just don't have enough information to make an informed decision. So I'll turn it over to our engineer to go through the checklist of what we really need here. So 
Well, I think I think the chairman summed it up pretty well here, but everybody, everyone should be in receipt of our February 17, 2016 letter. I think copies were provided to the applicant as well. Uh, in the letter, Paul summarizes 11 items which are required by the town's ordinance, as well as the redevelopment plan submission items that are required for this for this type of application. Um, and Paul finds a number of them lacking, specifically item three, item four, item five, item six, and item eight. And I can go over them in more detail, but item three, the open space plan, there's Recreation and open space areas proposed on the plan, but there's no information on how uh, they're going to be maintained, who's going to own them. Um, item four is very similar with the water and wastewater. Uh, the no information provided on, on ownership or maintenance of those facilities. Item five is the stormwater plan. Um, the ordinance requires some preliminary sizing calculations, volume counts, so we can check the you know the adequacy of the, of the concept plan that was not provided uh, item six is the environmental inventory uh, paul notes that no geologic information was provided and that's especially important because of all the limestone and karst uh, geology in the area item eight which he calls to is the the utilities there's information on water and sewer on the plan but none of the other utilities uh, no, nothing on electric cable and i realize some of that uh, obviously is going to be it's going to be ironed out in the future, but his main concerns are three, four, five, and six at this time. Uh, and, and really just the feeling is additional information needs to be provided. It would obviously be helpful if that's provided on plans. So we, we as well, the, the professionals as well as the board members have this information at their fingertips so they can evaluate the application. Um, pretty much it unless anybody else has any questions but yeah that, that was Paul's strong feeling is we really need to have that information up front in order for us to properly evaluate what's being proposed. Did you mention the environmental uh, impact? Did you mention that? I, I didn't mention environmental impact specifically one of the items is environmental inventory they did provide a plan set that included a number of environmental constraints floodplain areas, uh, wetland areas, but what we called attention to was the fact that it was lacking with certain geologic information. Um, so yeah, our position is really to deem this, this application incomplete until that is provided by way of plan revisions, supplemental reports, what have you. Um, that's our stance. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I uh, make a few more remarks? Um, I'm Joe Pryor. I wear two hats. I sit on the planning board and the, and the council, so um, I have to look at this, you know, doubly careful. Um, my big concern is the traffic impact. Um, to me, personally, I think site plan issues get worked out, but the traffic is a big one. Um, Number one, it seems the numbers in your report are just so far apart from Mazer. I'd recommend that the, your consultant and our consultant get together and see if they can't work on those numbers a little bit. Um, I, don't, I don't know how we could evaluate numbers here and numbers there. Uh, the second thing is even the numbers you have, I, um, I wonder if they consider certain things. Number one is the... Um, Phillipsburg Mall is well below occupancy right now. Um, someday with the economy, that'll bounce back and the, the numbers will be completely different out of there. When it first opened and they were 100% occupancy, we had a lot of traffic. It's got a lot of empty stores and that's probably the traffic counts that, that you use. Second, we have uh, a development under construction right down the road from you, Sycamore Landing. I didn't see where that was uh, mentioned or considered. Um, we have a new high school about to open in September, um, basically at the end of Roseberry. I don't know how that traffic will affect um, the area. Uh, it'll certainly affect the area near the high school, probably even on 22. So at least you should give that a look. Um, and on the books right now, there's, there's litigation, but eventually that'll end. Uh, so at least for now, we have an asphalt 
plant approved on Strikers Road um, during paving season. That's going to generate a lot of traffic. So I think those things were missed. I, um, in my own mind, I'm having trouble reconciling these numbers with just my view of the, the site. You got about 4.2 million square feet. I'm thinking in a million square foot building, the one in Lopat, you'd probably have 90 truck bays. That's 90 trucks in, 90 trucks out. I don't know how many cycles in a day. I don't know how many shifts. I got to assume two if for that sort of investment. You multiply that by 4.2, that's a lot of trucks. And I don't, somebody's going to have to get me to these numbers. Right now, that's what I have in my mind. Third Street, um, <coughs> that is really the main exit to 22 for Morris Park. Um, Rose Hill Heights, um, much of the central part of Lopat. It only takes one truck trying to make a turnaround there to tie that up. You're going to have a uh, cycle and you're going to get three cars through. Um, I would like to see some discussion on 3rd Street. Um, the other thing is the traffic impact study seemed to focus on just getting um, cars out on the highway. <clears throat> if you leave your site, you have a multi-phase intersection at the mall. You got one at 519. You got one at Walmart. You got another one before you hit 78. I've lived here for 43 years. I've traveled east probably for 35 of them. It doesn't take very many semis to tie that up. It takes a long time for them to slow down, a long time for them to accelerate. Somebody came up with a uh, level of service B. I'm not there yet. You're really going to have to show me. So to me, that's key. And to go into the details before we get that settled, I, I, I think, is putting the cart before the horse. I do have one other, uh, two other comments. <laughs> um, we're talking about 5% coming from the north on 57. I'm curious what that route is. 519 has a um, underpass under a railroad, has a severe height limit. A lot of trucks avoid that. Many trucks get stuck in there. Uh, I'd be curious where the Route 57 trucks are coming from, what neighborhood they're going to go through. Um, the plans have a commuter railroad station, uh, well, a community railroad station. I don't know what that is. The original discussions before the planning board talked about much of the product being shipped in by rail. Now we have a community railroad station. So I don't know what, I really don't know what that is. Um, I'd like to know a lot more about that. And finally, um, the sewer. Um, the entire 300 some odd acres um, goes down to Roseberry. Uh, you're probably going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000 gallons. Um, Lopat has a contract, and we discharge at Roseberry, the other side of the highway. Um, there's been problems in that sewer. It gets rainy. They get overflows in the, uh, the apartments there. Uh, we've had trouble getting uh, treatment works approvals. Um, I know there's a line that connects to a sewer. I'd like to be assured that there's downstream capacity for that. And I know it's in Peaburg, but it affects us. Every connection we make here, we need a treatment works approval from Phillipsburg. So those are my major concerns. I'm confident. Uh, I, I don't know about the geology. That's always an issue here in uh, in Lopat in this area. I think the other things can be worked out, but uh, to me, those are very important issues, and I, I'd really like to see more information on that before we pass on a on a concept plan. I certainly understand your concern, Councilman and, and Chairman. Um, we have. Uh, taking those items into consideration we do have our traffic expert here who can go through all the traffic items that you noted um, and to explain sometimes the numbers are presented one way um, in one report another way another report by different engineers not saying anyone's twisting numbers or hiding numbers it's just the, the format they chose to present them in um, he'll be able to explain um, how the maser re review in his report they, they jive the numbers work out 
um, I'll have him testify as to uh, addressing the input of all the other places you indicated the potential new high school, Sycamore Landing, and the Phillipsburg Mall. Um, they've done extensive traffic studies. Um, we had extensive testimony in Phillipsburg on, on all these similar issues. Uh, so we're prepared to address those. Uh, I did, uh, getting back to Mr. Sturbin's report, I did have a chance to speak with Mr. Sturbin's today. Um, and uh, let him know how we were going to respond to those. Certainly nothing was binding, and he said, yes, that's fine, tell the board it's good. I don't certainly want to Im imply that in any fashion. Uh, however, some of the items um, that do, we did request a waiver. He does note there's a waiver. Uh, certain items can be provided by testimony. Um, I don't think they are going to make a radical difference on anyone's review of it. For example, ownership of the streets and utilities and things of that nature, 99% of that is going to be privately owned. There will be no municipal uh, services being uh, required for those. The um, other main item was the utilities uh, that uh, the engineer had pointed out this evening in the stormwater. Uh, we have prepared to give testimony to address those issues. Again, uh, not trying to, you know, brush off the issue, but again, it is a general development plan approval. We're not at site plan. Uh, we do have testimony sufficient, uh, we believe, for the board and the board's professionals to review the level of utilities provided and the ability to service the project. Um, again, we have provided that in here in Phillipsburg. I don't mean to keep referring to Phillipsburg, but just letting you know, we, we have thought about these issues. We have dealt with the issues. The um, environmental inventory, uh, we do have additional information that we certainly recognize we need to provide to your professionals to make sure they're comfortable with the environmental condition of the property, the remediation that's been done, and how it will be handled going forward, the impact this project will have on any existing environmental conditions, um, and certainly providing the geological information as well. Um, so we believe that we will be able to address these items. We certainly understand if your professionals want more level of detail to review, we would certainly provide that to them and come back another night. Uh, however, I, I would implore the board to allow us to proceed this evening to put a decent amount of testimony on. I think it will address a lot of issues, and as I indicated in my opening comments, uh, additional feedback from the board of items, no offense, uh, Councilman, that other board members may have thought of that you didn't bring up, um, that would allow us to give more detail to the entire board, the public, and the professionals. I think it would be a productive evening. Yeah, I, I understand that. and. Um... On the other hand, I, it, traffic is very important with me, and uh, testimony is sometimes difficult to digest and so on. I think these things should have been addressed in here, particularly the impact on, on all the lights running out to 78. I ride it. Uh, you know, I ride it in the morning. I ride it at rush hour. I know how long it takes me from get to one end to the other. I can just see all these trucks on there, and I have no idea what your operating plan looks like. So. It, my input to the rest of the board is they've come out if we want to hear uh, some more information uh, and maybe generate some more questions I wouldn't object to that but um, I don't think I'm prepared to um, you know vote on anything tonight sir I wouldn't ask you to vote yeah. if you don't feel you have the sufficient information I certainly understand and respect that I think we're at a position here is there any more comment from the, uh, the board or questions I, I agree with with Joe, and just and just just further clarify. It looks like there's a section of the report here that you assume a growth rate of two percent for three years and half a percent for seven years. That doesn't sound realistic to me, as we were talking about as the Phillipsburg Mall grows. That's not a realistic growth rate. Um, so, and, and I can I do share all of Joe's concern with traffic as well. Noted, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. So, I and think, furthermore, uh, I'm sorry. as far as traffic, I, I would have taken it a step further as well, not just out to 78, but uh, an additional light beyond uh, further into Phillipsburg. We probably already reviewed, but that information wasn't necessarily presented to us, but we're concerned about it going that direction west as well. Understood. I would. Do you have any comments? The, the only thing I would say, I mean, ultimately it's up to the board here, but I, I would say that it's it's perfectly within your right to, to want some of these questions and some of this information to be submitted <clears throat> in writing or via plan revisions ahead of time so that you have a chance to review it and digest it. Um, again, if, if you want to take uh, or listen to some testimony, that that's up to you guys, but 
I certainly think you're within your right to, to want this information submitted up front so you have a chance to review and, and really get a hold of it. Some of the information that uh, we're requesting here and I really don't think that we want to do any waiver, uh, grant any of the waivers this evening. If you could put all the information you have in into a better traffic study, <coughs> the information we need on the waiver report, reports, uh, I would prefer that. So, would, yes, Chair? I read your traffic report. Uh, you showed the third street intersection. You only uh, show right hand thumb the way I read the report. I don't see the jump handle of that. Okay, sir. I, I don't have it in front of me, but I take your word for it. And then we'll either have our expert testify or provide additional. Joe said we have a close holder, Martin Baker, and all your trucks coming down Route 57 to make their U turn, we'll say, get out on the 78, come down and use that third street jug handle. They don't necessarily make a right hand turn on third street. And I only see your arrow. 90 degrees to the right, I don't see the address. Let me jump in for a second. Just procedurally, for the benefit of the, <clears throat> especially the, the, the new board members, we're at a point in time where you have to decide uh, as a board whether you want to deem this application complete and start the public hearing process. Uh, you can say, yes, you want to hear testimony, or you can say, we need more information submitted in writing reviewed by our professionals before we're prepared to deem this application complete and go forward. If, if I may say something, I, I, I think it's beneficial. I echo everything anybody has said here, uh, especially Joe, and um, there's so many new planning board members on here, and I personally feel, and I don't mean to diminish your, your qualification, but I would be more comfortable if Paul would be here because he is intimately involved in the, in the project. And, and he's probably the one who knows most about it. So uh, I would prefer if I have information in writing, and I would prefer if I have Paul here who can answer any questions which may arise. Well, not having Paul here may not be a very good reason because a member of the a representative of his office is here. But if you feel the professionals need additional documentation in writing to review so they can report back to you on that information uh, before. We move forward with the public hearing. It's certainly within the right. I think that's the I have a question. About the, in, in reading the general development plan and the write up presented, uh, further detail is irrelevant because they say this is just conceptual anyway. The details are going to come when they come back for actual site plan. So, <clears throat> does this meet the requirements of the general development plan? No. Okay. This is this is a conceptual plan. Paul Sturbins is not here, but I've read a lot of his reports and reading between the lines with the number of incomplete items that are not satisfied under the completeness category. I think what he's saying without saying is that he doesn't have enough. So, I think the, uh, if I'm wrong, well, I'll entertain a motion to deny the uh, Deem the application incomplete, and we'll move on from there. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Do I have a second? I second it. Roll call, Beth, please. Members Fox? No. Johnson? No. Oshinsky? No. Fryer? I'm sorry. I, we're, we're deeming it incomplete, or um, I lost the motion here. It's incomplete. To deem the application incomplete. So well, I want a yes vote, right? Then, <laughs> well, we might need to start over. Yeah. Deeming it incomplete. Okay, can we yeah. clarify that and, and start the roll call again? Yeah. The motion, I, I think my motion was to deem it incomplete. So a yes vote means it's incomplete. Correct. I'll start, start over again. Start the vote. <laughs> Member Spots? No. Fryer? No. Johnson? No. I, I can speak for myself, thank you. <laughs> Johnson? Yes, incomplete. Oshinsky? Yes, incomplete. Fryer? Yes. Wolf? Yes. Mayor McKay? Yes. Vice Chairman Durrell? Yes. Chairman Van Lee? Yes. 
Understood. Uh, uh, if I may just clarify one thing, don't want to downplay Mr. Uh, Ritter's report. Uh, we do have his report, and he makes similar comments, although a different vein as he is a planner, uh, as to the uh, engineer. We will also, um, so we don't take more of your time, we will directly contact Mr. Ritter to make sure whatever we submit satisfies yes. his need as well. You're welcome to do that to contact our professional to cut down the time. And we look forward to your application coming back. Yeah, I, I wouldn't second that. I would encourage you to, to work out these of numbers. Course, of course. And, and if I may, um, since we have properly noticed, can we have the notice continue to the next meeting in March uh, so we don't have to renotice? notice? Yes. That's acceptable. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. At this time, you got to go in a second. Apologize. Yeah, take your time. You know, but, um, I don't recall seeing it. It's part of the at this point, we're going to enter into a joint session with the uh, Wapak on Township Council. I, I, have, uh, I have a quick question before we do. Yes. Um, if, if I can, I don't know if this is appropriate. Um, I wanted to hear back from our attorney and continue the discussions on the ROM district zoning. Um, last month, we had suggested that he report back to us at this meeting, and I wanted to see, you know, what we, do we have to do. I know you requested it be put on the agenda, but since it looked like it could have been a very lengthy night tonight, I deferred that to the next meeting. We will discuss it then and all the ramifications of it, because it could get a little bit past the time I want to take up now. So Okay, so, so I did go through the proper procedure to, to attempt to get it yes. on the agenda. But There's because a, because it's a joint meeting and it's going to be potentially long, that's the exactly. Reason. I don't, you know, okay. but we want to have more public here tonight. I didn't want to hold them up, and we certainly didn't want to get past the ten o'clock hour. So. Actually, no. I want. I just I wasn't aware of the reason, so I wanted to clarify that. Okay. So no, I, I took. In, I think I I emailed you indicating that you know we would be discussing it in the later. And I didn't have time to reach out to you oh, and find okay. out why. Okay. I just wanted to find out why. If yeah. I didn't do it properly. It was, Kind of okay. I think if there are any ancillary issues that uh, board members want to raise, why don't we wait until the end of the joint session and the presentation by Larkin, mm -hmm. and then if any board members want to raise any issues and we have time, let's do it then. Okay, is uh, the Larkin applicant here? Yeah. Good evening, uh, members of the council, members of the board, Ron Shimanowitz, uh, four Larkin associates. First of all, thank you for convening this meeting. I know it's a little bit unusual, but we're happy to be in front of uh, both bodies so we can make our presentation uh, to both the planning board and the council. Uh, Larkin is the contract purchaser of about a 16-acre site that's frontage on Route 27, Route 57, and uh, I'm from Middlesex County, that's why that came out. Uh, Route 57 and Baltimore Street. Uh, we've been before uh, both the uh, planning board and the council a few times since past March. It's been about a year we've been at this. We were last before you in November, and the recommendation was made to uh, do a notice meeting, which you've now done. You've invited the public, and to have this joint meeting. So we've, this has kind of been a process. Uh, we're here tonight to uh, make a full presentation to you, to describe what our development proposal is. Just to give you a little preview for those of you who maybe have not heard it before, uh, we actually have uh, two options in our proposal. One is a, uh, a proposal that includes both a residential development as well as a commercial development, uh, and as well as a second proposal that is entirely residential development. Uh, the site is currently zoned highway business. Uh, the, the, the real request from the applicant through this entire process is for a rezoning to allow the residential development. Uh, our, our hope through all this is really to work cooperatively. We uh, are a party uh, to your uh, affordable housing litigation. 
Uh, that sounds a little uh, adversarial. We hope that it's not adversarial. We hope that actually this site ends up sort of filling whatever gaps you, you may have, and you'll hear from our experts on that. We think we actually can help the town uh, in sort of uh, managing its number and satisfying <coughs> its number as well. Uh, with that brief introduction, uh, we do have uh, several witnesses with us tonight and some exhibit boards to show you. So with the chair's permission, I would like to call my first witness. Absolutely. Our first Mr. witness chair, is... Uh, before Mr. Shimano is presents any witnesses, and, and by the way, uh, some of you know me, some of you may not. My name is Lawrence Stone. I'm a partner with Katrina Campbell, and as you know, Katrina's on vacation on this time. But I did attend, along with Mr. Shimanowitz and his clients, and Mr. Ritter today, a meeting involving the um, litigation on affordable housing, which the Pat is seeking a certification. Just so everybody understands, you may already know this. Wife and Associates is what we call an intervener in this case. So they are they're participating in that case uh, and uh, seeking to uh, if ultimately their property is not rezoned and uh, granted certain relief. Uh, they are going to participate in determining the fair share obligation of Wapaka, um, and, and obviously because they want a higher fair share obligation that will ultimately they will then if there's a fair share obligation which is uh, uh, in excess of what we think is a surplus right now uh, they will be making application ultimately for the rezoning of their property and for a particular development the reason for this presentation again uh, we met today with the special master who was assigned by the court elizabeth mcmanus and um, uh, her, her, one of her main roles is to determine whether or not she can mediate a settlement. Uh, an important participant in, the, in any mediation in this issue is the Fairshire Housing Center, which is a, a basically a, a party in all of these litigations, even though they're not a formal intervener. The Supreme Court has designated them. So they did not participate in today's uh, session. So we couldn't really talk about the tension we talked about with uh, Mr. Shimanowitz and his client. But we didn't get down to particulars with Fair Share House. The, um, uh, the master is going to be reaching out to, share, for, to contact Fair Share House and see in the next round that they participate. So that I, I want everybody, there's, I guess, in the context of what they're making this application. This is not an application for a site plan or is intended to be a site plan. It is not even what we call a conceptual plan. It's, it's an issue of determination of a potential change in zoning that they are requesting, which in their opinion, and I don't want to take any thunder away from them, would, would uh, assist in any issue that we may have with the affordable housing component for the PACA. So um, with that in mind, I want everybody to understand that this is uh, something that they're presenting as a concept. It's not something new. I think it's been heard before. And potentially of reaching at this point uh, a potential uh, settlement claim, which uh, at some future date, because I know tonight's going to be late and this would be done in, in closed sessions because it involves ongoing litigation. Uh, certain ideas that we may have as far as Mr. Ritter and myself and, and your engineer, Katrina, and uh, we'll present that to you later on and uh, where we think uh, that we stand with reference to the fair share housing obligation of the PACON, if any, in the future. So uh, you're going to hear some information concerning that and their uh, potential contribution to fill what they foresee as a potential need along with why this is good development. So I just want everybody to understand the outline of this, that this is very conceptual and it's in line with reference to potential um, uh, change in zoning for this property, which is now zoned commercial, but which they want to zone it for multifamily residential. By the way, setting aside the affordable component uh, there may be other reasons to grant this uh, uh, as the applicant wants to proceed. So there's two bases that 
their position is that uh, you have a you're going to have a higher requirement for affordable housing, and that this is going to meet or at least help meet uh, that component. And number two, that they feel in any event it's a good development. Uh, so I just want everybody everybody to understand the context. And if you have any questions procedurally or what we're doing, I'll be happy to. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, if I could, just a question for Mr. Cohn. The um, litigation that's going on, um, as I understand it, uh, we've submitted one set of numbers. Other people are submitting other set of numbers. The intervener submitted a set of numbers. And the outcome of that, the settlement, is a number, our number of low-cost units. Is that correct? The If there is a settlement, number one, yeah. Just so everybody understands, and, and it's just a prior, right? Yes. Okay. Um, when, when you say that we presented numbers, we theoretically have not presented any numbers. We have participated in a report for file, uh, as you know, prepared by e-consult uh, uh, consultants um, that talks about what the state affordable housing need is and the region affordable housing need. We are in region two together with Morris and Union, and uh, uh, so we are in a particular region. Before you talk about a number for Lopacan or really any municipality within the county or within the region, you have to talk about the regional need before you potentially get it. That doesn't mean you can't settle uh -huh. the claim before there's a determination of the regional need. And then what, how all the municipalities within the region are supposed to share in that particular region of need. So we haven't developed a report. Mr. Ritter has developed a preliminary report, which we're required to do. We will be developing a more formal report. Our position, quite frankly, at this moment is that the way the e-consult report comes down, and we have a surplus right now uh, of 102 units. Now, I'm not going to tell you that that's going to hold up. I understand. We'll get into a closed session. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of discussion as to where we think this might be going. So our position, at least at this point, is, and based upon the report that we have participated, is that we don't have any future fair share need. That doesn't mean that the court will hold us to have one, that's, but that's our position. All right, where I'm heading with this, the outcome of that is not necessarily whether this parcel gets rezoned or not. It's going to be how many low-cost housing units we need. Exactly right. Okay. Uh, whether or not this parcel gets rezoned has nothing to do with what our fair share need is. All right. Okay? And, and our prospective fair share need and for what they call, which is now going to be, it appears uh, that there's going to be what we call the gap area added to that, which was from 99 to 2015, but that, that's another issue. So the court's going to determine that irrespective of whether this property is rezoned before that or is not uh -huh. rezoned or whatever. There's nothing to do with it except that if there is an arrangement made and Larkin signs on to that, they're not going to be in a position to say, hey, we think the fair share number in Lopacum, uh, the fair share housing report says they need 347 units over the next 10 years. We think it should be 450 units. Or we, we agree with the 347. Their position obviously is going to be to get as high as number, I shouldn't say high as number, but certainly to get a, a number over and above what we believe it's going to be so that they can, they will then make an app, assuming that there's a number and let's deal with, let's presume with, we have to uh, construct 150 units in the next 10 years. And we get a credit for the 102 units, so uh -huh. 48 units. They're the ones that are obviously going to be right after that decision coming in and say, by the way, here we are, and we can meet your 48 units uh, right here, or whatever, we can meet uh -huh. 35 or whatever it might be, or 30. And the town would be hard pressed not to look at that and be required to look at that. Well, That's I the context. But whether or not this property, and let's presume you decide to rezone this property, the planning board recommends and the council accepts, that doesn't mean we're out of a lawsuit. Uh -huh. We would look, my suggestion would be that we talk to Fair Share Housing to enter into a settlement agreement, which, by the way, just because Fair Share Housing uh, agrees on a number and Larkin agrees on a number doesn't mean that that's going to be the number. The court has to 
right. to look at that agreement and make an independent determination that that <laughs> uh, constitutionally uh, satisfies Lopacon's fair share housing obligation, even though the parties that are, are particularly involved agree on a settlement. And one, one last thing, I'll be quiet, I'll let the applicant sure. start. If the court comes down and says we need more units than we, we have, we are giving a period of time to remedy that, are we not? You are normally given a period of time to, to uh, provide what would be a um, uh, advising to your housing master plan and your fair share uh, housing plan and adoption of ordinances uh, uh, to do that. You would be under the review of the master who's probably now appointed to do that, um, although there have been no uh, municipalities that have been put in that position, to my knowledge, as of this day. That would probably be the procedure, mm -hmm. okay? And obviously, at that time, uh, you can, if we went that far, you would consider this property along with other properties uh, in the municipality and, and uh, as to see how you're yeah. going to accomplish to give a reasonable opportunity. It doesn't mean that you have to meet that in the next yeah. 10 years. You have to provide a reasonable opportunity to do it. Okay, thank you, Counselor. And, Good explanation. And that, that's a lot of information yes. in about 15 minutes. Thank you. But if anybody has any more questions, and, and Mr. Shimanos may want to comment on what I said. But. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> my comment on Mr. Cohn's comments is I think he very accurately summarized a very complicated issue. The only thing I would add to it is just a request of both the Planning Board and the Council to remember that even though this is very much intertwined with your decision making on your affordable housing compliance, it's also a straight up zoning request. So there are regular old planning issues to think about. Part of our uh, position or our communication to you is that the site is zoned commercial, highway business. The commercial development in town right now, of which the Larkins have developed a great deal, is not strong. To do more of it is probably not the wisest thing. The site is pretty much surrounded by residential, which you'll figure all this from the experts. But I just want you to keep that thought in mind as well, that independent of, and it might be hard for you to do, but independent of the COA issues, there is just a straight up planning issue. What is appropriate for this site today? And with that introduction, I would again like to bring up Mr. Mr. Heibel, our engineer. Well, Bob, if you could just sort of orient us to the site and then give us an overview of what the proposal is. This is actually the fourth time I'll speak about the proposal plan. This is actually the fourth time that I've presented this. And I'm the table setter here tonight. I'm the engineer. I'm also here to show the board where the property is and what the overall is. Uh, the property is uh, four lots that is currently owned by the Piazza family, Lark and Associates, has it under contract. Uh, it's on the southern side of Baltimore Street, constitutes 16.6 .6 acres of totality. Um, along the western boundary of the property is an existing 300 foot uh, easement, New Jersey Public Service easement. Um, and there's also a screen that borders the western portion of the property. It happens to be what's known as a Category 1 screen, which is the highest category. It has a 300-foot wide riparian buffer, and that's shown in red on, on this plan. That portion of the property, it could not be developed without permits that you probably not get from not hardly any development. Um, when I first spent to the north of here is uh, Warren Heights North, which is the Larkin uh, Bell. To the west is Warren Heights uh, South, which Larkin also developed. Uh, to the east is an office building, and it used to be a child care center. I think this might be now a second office building, uh, which Larkin also owns and, and developed. And to the southeast is an existing shopping center of 33,000 square feet, which Larkin also owns and has developed a new strike plaza. Um, when I came here the first time, uh, we asked that the, the property, which is currently in the HD zone, be rezoned to multi family inclusionary zoning. That would allow a total of 12 dwelling units per acre. 
based on the 16.6 acres, that would be a yield of 199 dollar units, some of which would be market units, some of which could be affordable housing for the total. For the total. Uh, the board expressed at that first meeting that there might be a desire from some members of the uh, planning board and the township council to leave some of the property uh, in the HV zone, specifically the property along uh, 27. So we did a second plan, it's exactly the same plan. But what I did is I carved out two acres, which are contiguous with Route 57. That would leave 14.6 acres that would ask to be rezoned to the MF1 zone, MFI zone. Uh, that would yield 175 residential units and some detail within that area. You're going to hear from our architectural consultants who did the concept plan that it would come out to some 8,000. I think it was 8,700 8, square feet of retail, which could be placed on that two acres, along with 175 dwellings. Uh, the, the, the area has access to the public utilities, uh, public water, public sanitary sewer. Um, I read the report. I, I, I know how much capacity the township currently has. Uh, I'm, we're certainly aware of the ongoing investigation which will act on regarding some of that capacity. Uh, it's our understanding that there's available capacity in your current allocations for a project like this. The ultimate capacity uh, for either one of the two projects would be somewhere from about 40 to 43,000, which around that much gallons per day. Uh, and we believe that there's available sanitary capacity for that amount of gallons. Um, we have here the architectural consultant, the financial consultant, the planning consultant, and the traffic engineer. That will briefly go through uh, those aspects uh, of the project. Um, without further ado, unless there's any specific <coughs> questions, we'd probably like to bring on the architectural consultant mm -hmm. to show you the two right out. So I will register. Unless there's questions of Mr. Heibel, the, our oh, next witness would be Rob Larson. Okay, is there any uh, board members? That, uh, well, okay. again, this is way down the road, but. Um, on the capacity, there's not only the allocation, but again, like I said, there's downstream capacity issues in Peeberg, and that would be part of anything going forward. Okay. You said that uh, commercial development in this area was stagnant. Right now, the Pipeline Township, we just saw Andrew Saul ran. Well, I would just respectfully ask you to listen to our whole presentation, and uh, I understand your comment about some of those other properties, as some of those are warehouse and uh, other type of uses. Uh, my client's actually the owner, developer of the nearby uh, commercial center, and that, that certainly has been struggling. So, you know, that's why we're here to sh share our views. But I just ask you to hear our presentation before you draw any conclusions about a reason. So the council understands and I'm sure the planning board. There's no, this is not an application asking for a decision or any decision. It's merely a presentation uh, so that members of both the planning board and the council to ask questions, uh, to ask for some additional information if they feel necessary. And that's all this is, is an exchange of ideas at this point. Nobody's asking for any decisions, nobody's asking for any, uh, you know, uh, ideas as to where you think you're going on this. That's for us to discuss in the future how this plays into uh, our affordable housing concept uh, may come into discussion at some future time, but there are no 
decisions to be made tonight. This is not that type of an application. It isn't even a general development as you heard before the previous application. And, and that doesn't restrict anybody from making any comments on whether they feel, uh, but there, there's no decisions that are going to be made. Our next witness is Rob Larson, our architect and site planner. Okay, hi, uh, Rob Larson. I am the architect and planner with the firm of Chester Bruce Sasaski. Um, also been here before and worked with Mr. Heibel on coming up with some concepts here. And I'm going to present two concepts and just some example architecture as part of my presentation. Uh, the two concepts will be much uh, will be in line with what Mr. Heibel just described. The first one I'm going to put up is for the first uh, scenario which Mr. Heibel described, which is for a uh, residential development of the entire 16 point of the nine acres. Um, again, I took a look at the area in discussions with, with Mr. Heibel on whatever restrictions there would be. I considered the uh, frontage on Route 57, Baltimore Street, and also uh, you'll see there's some possible connections to the adjacent users. Uh, so, what I've come up with here is actually a, uh, a mix of two and three story structures laid out in the concept plan with a boulevarded entrance off of Route 57. The pension basin considered a recreation center, and uh, as you can see, we have six buildings which I'll show you are three story, uh, what I would call walk up flat structures, and then these perimeter units, which are uh, two story uh, uh, apartments with garages. And I feel that these are in context with the surrounding architecture, the surrounding uh, developments of Warren Heights, and um, as I said, we also do show a minor connection. If you felt it was necessary to these other properties for convenience. Drive this connected to these are our concepts here. Second concept plan I'm going to put up, <coughs> as was mentioned, it sets aside a two-acre parcel. I'm showing uh, this building right here, uh, the red 8700 square foot retail structure. It would maintain, I guess, a, uh, a sense of retail out here on Route 57. I've also moved our recreation center, which I thought was more appropriate in terms of uh, context. And again, I'm, I'm proposing now five of those uh, three-story uh, structures with continuing with the uh, <laughs> perimeter of two-story apartments as well. Again, maintaining a connection out to Baltimore Street, Boulevard and entrance on Route 57, and connections to the other existing uh, development parcels. I'm not going to slow a little bit quickly here. I'm going to put up what we see. Again, this is conceptual, but what we're trying to show here is that we intend to build some very attractive architecture. Um, uh, what we see on top here, noted, noted as elevation type one, would be for the three story structures. And what we see on the bottom here, uh, noted as elevation two, uh, are the two story garage product. And, oh. um, question. How many bedrooms are you planning for I believe it would be a, a, a mix of one and twos. And then obviously, whatever component, if there were an affordable component, would be would meet, uh, the necessary capital. Um, actually, you're, you touch on something which I'm hoping I can get across. So we're trying to provide a variety that there may not just be one type of one thing, and we try to provide a variety of housing sizes and types. Um, the large units maybe would be a case of the premium, and then the other units would be uh, you know, a mix of one and two of these three story structures. <laughs> okay. So uh, I have a clarification that uh, discussions have been two thirds, two, and one third, one, with a market unit that would be presented. And the, we were looking at a, a 199 unit scenario and a 107 unit scenario. Um, I should also uh, make the point that if there is an affordable housing component, but I've designed the architecture similar to uh, this, we integrate the units into the structures, the interspersing them with the structures that are developed. It's not, it's not our intention, I guess, as part of this concept, to put the units. So again, I hope you know, just as the uh, again, having prepared the concepts and shown the example architecture, we're trying to get across that conceptually we'd like to build a pretty exciting project that uh, I think is attractive to all. Thank you, Rob. I just have one quick question. The board, one of the earlier boards, could you just pull it out? 
did you make a special effort to coordinate the colors of that plan with your tie and your shirt tonight? <laughs> 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 I thought your wife trashed you for a moment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Our next witness is uh, Mr. Art Bernard. He's going to speak actually to the affordable housing uh, component of this. I'm going to give him the podium since he doesn't have any forms. Good evening. Um, I know some of us have met before. Um, I thought I'd just give you a little bit of my background so you understand why. It's me talking to you tonight about affordable housing. Um, I'm a licensed professional planner with uh, 40 years of experience in uh, land use planning and affordable housing, and eight and a half, eight and a half of those years were spent uh, starting up the Council on Affordable Housing, uh, which is now <coughs> defunct. Um, but it, from 1986 to 1994, we got it started, and uh, I had the uh, the distinct pleasure and honor of writing uh, all of their regulations in the first round and the second round, the only regulations that they've been able to sustain. Um, and since leaving call in 1994, I've worked with some 24 municipalities around the state in various capacities, and I've worked with private sector clients all over the state um, before local boards and in Superior Court. I've served the Superior Court as a special master uh, in five different communities. Um, I've represented the New Jersey Builders Association as its affordable housing consultant for the last 20 years, and uh, it's fair to say that much of my practice revolves around the state's affordable housing obligation. And I still represent municipalities, and I, I think we may talk a little bit about, um, in terms of settlement, about the experience that I'm having with the court and Fairshire Housing Center. I guess we're the first ones that have gone through this process. Um, but before we get into that, I just wanted to talk about this site um, because Can I, I think. Just interrupt for one minute. Can you spell your last name? Sure, it's B E R N A R D. Um, I just want to talk about the site because I think whether it has affordable housing on it or not, it's just a great site for for attached housing. Um, if we can get um, you know, the, the site is uh, an infill site with access to public water and sewer, so it, it can certainly accommodate the higher densities. Um, it has access to Route 57, which is a state highway designed to move traffic from one community to another, so it has the uh, excellent access to jobs and shopping in the area. Uh, it also has access to Baltimore Street and, and can get to Stryker Road through the shopping center, so the site's traffic can be distributed to multiple points, and for traffic that's going to the corner of uh, Route 57 and Stryker Road, there's a traffic light, so people can make uh, uh, turning movements at a controlled intersection. In in terms of the land uses, I think you can see that it's a, uh, it's adjacent to attached housing to the north and to the west. So the proposed use is certainly compatible with adjacent land uses. Uh, it's adjacent to a shopping center. It's adjacent to a medical facility. It's in close proximity to the elementary school, which is just to the east and to the fire department that's just up to the north on Stryker Road. And it's just sound planning to locate attached housing uh, near shopping, schools, and municipal services. In terms of environmental issues, you've heard Mr. Heibel tell you that the, the western portion of the site of the property is impacted by the buffer area associated with Category 1 stream. But the remainder of the site can be developed consistent with DEP regulations. So when I look at it, I just think this is an excellent location for the proposed housing, even if there was no affordable housing obligation. But we know that there is one. Um, since 19, and, and some of the information I'm going to give you now is, is for people who aren't that ex familiar with this topic and perhaps for the public that's never had to deal with it. 
But since 1975, New Jersey Supreme Court has consistently found that each municipality is responsible for a share of low and moderate income housing. Now, who are these people that live in this housing? Who are these low and moderate income households? Well, they span a variety of professions, uh, including but not limited to teachers and nurses and social workers and paralegals and firefighters. They include young people starting out and older people on fixed income. Um, but these people either have worked their way into retirement or they are working. Um, they go through credit and criminal checks just like anybody else who rents a unit, and there's absolutely no reason to think that they wouldn't be an asset to the community. Um, a little bit more history. In, in the 1980s, the courts were um, had expressed displeasure that even though they had decided a case in 1975, not much was happening with low and moderate income housing. And so the courts were establishing municipal fair share numbers and awarding developers relief to build affordable housing. Some of you probably lived through that and remember that. Uh, there was a great deal of controversy about that. And eventually the legislature established the state agency to, to do this work, to implement the affordable housing obligation. And that was uh, my former agency, the Council on Affordable Housing. And Co was reasonable successful for a while, but for the past 15 years, it just was unable to do its job. Um, and in March of last year, New Jersey Supreme Court recognized that Co wasn't functioning anymore and ordered the lower courts to determine fair share again and to review municipal plans. It ordered the lower courts to utilize a specific formula to compute fair share. Now, shortly after that decision, the nonprofit that uh, Mr. Cohen was talking about, Fair Share Housing Center, utilized that formula and calculated a 347 unit fair share for Lopatcon for a period that started in 1999, last time that COA actually adopted rules, and extends 10 years into our future, into 2025. Um, the League of Municipalities countered by hiring a consultant, and that consultant has calculated a zero fair share for Lopatcon for a period not from 1999 to 2025, but from 2015 to 2025. The theory is the past is the past, and we don't have to worry about it. Now, who's right? Well, right now, we don't know if either party is going to totally prevail, but we do know a couple of things. We do know that two courts have issued rulings that the housing obligation must be addressed from 1999 to 2025. <clears throat> so we now know that uh, the League of Municipalities consultant will probably have to address, have to come up with a way to address 16 more years of a housing obligation. That's a big deal. You know, he, he figured out a housing need for 10 years, now he's got to figure it out for 26 years. Um, the league's consultant also, in his latest submission to the court, uh, has conceded that it must amend its work in at least two ways uh, that will add to each municipal housing obligation. I'm only about halfway through that report, um, but he's conceded at least two ways that, that could yield substantial increases in the housing obligation. Now, one of the disadvantages of court is there's some uncertainty, there's some risk. But one of the advantages of being in court, other than co, is the court likes to settle cases rather than going through expensive trials. State agency can't do that. Uh, the court can, and in your case, the court has been clear that it would like to settle all of its cases. Um, we've been through a similar situation in Middlesex County, uh, where the court has uh, actually um, set reduced housing obligations and is in the process of reducing them substantially uh, um, as a carrot to settle the cases. Um, I think I was involved in the first one in Piscataway um, where there was a substantial reduction in return for uh, a solid plan for affordable housing that met uh, where we were able to settle with Fair Share Housing Center. And I think the, bet, the, the opportunity exists here as well. Um, the township has an opportunity not only to limit its, its legal fees, uh, but to gain control of its fair share number and control where the housing is actually built. 
Um, and it can do so, I think, in part by uh, taking a serious look at this site. So I'd be happy to answer any of your questions if you have any. Mr. Bernard, if you could present <coughs> to the board, we haven't heard this yet, what the proposed affordable housing component would be under other plan. The the proposal is is to comply with the state standards uh, and at fifteen percent of the total number of units that uh, would be affordable units and that they would comply in all respects with the state regulations that deals with the bed bedroom mix and the pricing and the deed restrictions and the affirmative market. Well, uh, I understand that, but my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, so that members of both boards can understand it, is that the 200 number and the 175 number proposed are the gross number of units, and incorporated in there would be a 15% set aside of the units for affordable housing. Is that correct? That's accurate. So for the 200 unit example, there would be 30 affordable units. Right, and 175 would be 20 something, whatever that comes out to. Um, so I just want everybody to understand that's what the proposal is. And I want to, you know, make sure. Thank you. <coughs> Where are we staying if it doesn't meet the program? That's a different issue. No. By the way, nobody at this point, just so you understand, is saying that we need these additional numbers, or if we do need additional numbers, uh, that this is going to meet the ultimate quota. The applicant is not presenting it that way, but they, have, as Mr. Bernard indicated, that this is, in his opinion, a, a good site for this development, which would meet whatever our number is going to be, if there's going to be a future number, up to 30 units, at least as they propose it now, of affordable housing. How many do you have in township right now? Uh, George can probably answer that. I, I knew it this morning. But well, we, we have credits for 102. We have, we believe we have credits, in other words, that we can apply against this up to 102 units. Now, but, but, yeah, by the way, so you just understand that. Let's presume the court bought into the highest number possible, as Mr. Bernard mentioned, 347 we would maintain that we have 102 credits. By the way, credits is different than separate units. That's not saying we have 102 <coughs> separate surplus units. We have more than that in town, but they meet previous need, uh, requirements. But the, uh, we have what we call credits, because you get certain credits for rental units, you get credits for uh, group homes by, by number of bedrooms rather than than actual separate residential units. So we believe we have 102 credits. That is open for review by the court also. And that potentially could be reduced to 102 credits. But let's presume the 102 credits stick. And the highest number for the science to us is 347. You deduct 102. And over the next until 2025, you've got to come up with the differential numbers of the 245. So uh, that's that's the way how the, the math works. If that were, this would be a very small opportunity. We don't anticipate if there is an additional need <coughs> at this point. We'll say more in those sessions where we think we don't anticipate uh, that it's going to come B three forty seven. Right? It may be zero. Be right, but it could be three forty seven, and it could be anywhere in between. You indicated that the uh, COA is now defunct. Yeah. Is the deed restriction going to still carry on with affordable housing? Yes. Okay. I believe we'll pack on offers a mix of uh, housing opportunities, the best in this region. Um, we have apartments that you know fit into the financial uh, category to lack the deed restriction yeah I, I understand that uh, there are I mean there are clear regulations that deal with uh, this has been an issue for years in a number of communities um, 
in most situations, however, in order to get a credit, you do need a deed restriction. Fine. I was just wondering yeah. if it was going to remain in, yeah. in effect. Uh, you know, when you look at the region two, the average single family home that would be, I don't know, you know, affordable. At one point, I was hearing over two hundred thousand dollars. Is that a reasonable figure, or? You mean would that be affordable to a, a moderate income house? Uh, what I'm saying is, in Region Two, that was the price of an affordable house. Um, well, there's a range of prices that are affordable. That uh, may be affordable at the top end of moderate, but certainly not for low. So certainly not for the lower end of moderate either. But, but. Can I? As, mu as much as I appreciate your 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 insights here, I'm not sure why you're actually part of the presentation. I, I feel you're just trying to scare me a little. We, we at this point in time, we don't know if we have enough core units or not, right? Nobody knows if I, we are I, complying if or I not. If you felt like I tried to scare you, I a I, little. I, I apologize. I, I clearly did not try to do that. I, I'm not sure why, why this, this presentation the, of the core is even an issue of, of the whole presentation. I, I think, I, I, well, because it's, it's um, it's part of the proposal. Uh, we are interveners in the case, and, okay. and and we are having discussions to see if we can settle the case. And so, what I try to give you today is not necessarily my opinion on what your fair share is going to be. I try to make it just factual. I got it. And I, I think everything I gave you was was factual, including what Fair Share Housing Center says that your number is and what um, the League of Municipalities consultant says your number is and what the court has done. Well, we don't know, right? Well, we, we do know, and that's what I was trying to do, is that we do know that the court has made a ruling about the fact that, um, that the League of Municipalities number was um, faulty because it, it didn't include a housing obligation for a time period that started in 1999 and ended in 2015. So it just it, it neglected 16 years of the housing. And and I guess that's the only place where I express an opinion that that was a big deal. I okay. think I think it's fairly obvious that when you're taking when you, you take a 26 year housing obligation and you neglect to include 16 years of it, it's a big deal. And so all I'm trying to convey is, is that in the position that we're all in right now, that there's elements of risk for everybody. I got it. it but and, that, and that we, have, we both, both parties have an opportunity to, to eliminate that risk. But the project should be able to stand on its own, right, without even the core thing. That should be... I, I absolutely believe that, that this site is an excellent site for this use, whether there was affordable housing on it or not. And I just want to clarify that we, in one of the plans, the max of core units is going to be around 30. That is going to be... That's the proposal. The proposal, 30. And, and we have 8,700 square feet of retail, I believe, was... With one of the proposals, there's some retail. I, I, I think it was in that... The calculation would probably be 27 units with the alternate uh, development. And just to expand a little bit on your question, point, because let's presume that we didn't think we have any co obligation associated. At this point, as the law stands in New Jersey, and as Mr. Bernard said, every municipality has a constitutional obligation to offer a reasonable opportunity for low and moderate income housing. We would be remiss, let's presume they were just making a development application to come in for 175 units, We're not proposing any, any low and moderate income housing because they believe that we have a surplus and we don't need low and moderate income housing. It obviously costs the builder money to build low and moderate income housing because they have to figure that in the price of the market units. They don't do that out of the goodness of their heart, obviously. We would be remiss, in my opinion, that to, to not ask them, well, aren't you going to provide any affordable housing? Plan? And they could come and say, hey, you've got 102 units. We don't want to build it. They are saying that, in their opinion, 
And by the way, nothing prevents a community from, from developing more affordable housing than the designated number that the court may give you. And in addition to that, when the next round comes about, which we assume is after 2025, unless the law really changes or something happens in the future, if you have surplus from previous rounds, that goes to your new numbers. So um, just keep that in mind. It's not just potentially for this litigation, it's also for the future and uh, uh, building, you know, providing what our constitutional obligation is. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would you know the numbers of, of the affordable housing unit in, in Sycamore Landing? Do you know how many units are added to Sycamore Landing? Do we? Well, it's 50, 50. 50 affordable units. 50. 50. Affordable. Okay. That, that's used when we said there's 102 excess credits in our opinion. That's include. Uh, no, that's not included. No, it is. That, no, that is. That, that, is that is including the 50 units in, in Sycamore Landing. Course. That's been approved. That's under construction. Thank you. Was that also 15%? That was 20. That was 20% set aside. And by the way, what they're offering is 15%. <laughs> says that's the offer. Uh, that doesn't prevent a builder, by the way, because that's a guideline. That doesn't prevent a builder from offering more, agreeing to build more, because there's a quick pro quo. Oh, was that a, a, a minimum? Oh, I got the impression that that was a minimum requirement, 15%. Well, there's a yes state. No. There's, a, there, there's a state standard. It's okay. it's it's 15% for rentals, but uh, uh, Mr. Cohen is. Yeah, I think it's correct that if we're entering in a negotiation and that's one of the issues on the table, we're going to talk about that. Yeah. I have a question regarding that. You know, you've heard all the development that people are looking to take uh, here in La Paz County. You've heard about the landing. Um, there's going to be between 250 units there, which will probably bring into the township uh, probably about 400 children. Um, and then if we were to go to your plan, that would probably bring in another two, four hundred children. I actually, I think you're going to hear from our fiscal expert who, I, I, I'm not trying to blow a smoky, I think he's by far the best fiscal expert in the state. I think he's going to, he's going to surprise you with, you know, what the data actually is for, for one and two bedroom rental apartments. I, I I think you're going to either not believe a word he says or be pleasantly surprised. No, if, if I may, I think if, if I remember properly, I think they they came out with some for Sycamore with some crazy amount of 13 kids. Yeah. I think yeah, you remember that it was some some amount like that, and we we're not 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 saying not saying it's going to be 13. But, but by the way, just so you know, on this issue, the state has done forgetting about. The, Next expert's going to win this, but the state has done, and, and Mr. Ritter can tell you, a substantial amount of data with reference to the generation of school children, because it's very important to the state, like it's acceptable, uh, that generate from different types of houses. So it's not only what this witness may testify, and you may tend to believe that or not believe it, or say, well, I know, you know, uh, that there's going to be one and a half units per there's there's state data that Mr. Ritter and uh, that is available for this information, and uh, I think it's going to be more towards at least the data that I'm familiar with, mm -hmm. lower numbers from the state data than, than uh, you know one one child per unit or half a child per unit or something like that. I, just, I, I worry about our school school two schools that we have here and already work beyond capacity. Well, um, I'm not going to tell you there aren't going to be any school children, but uh, you know, I've I've seen the data. I've seen data that actually, when municipalities do the study, I've seen it when developers do the study, and when they actually look at the units, that I think you, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah, I'm not sure who I can ask what question. I, I know that Mr. Gardner, hello, is currently, do we know how many units of his old development is actually currently not rented? I don't. 
So at, at one point in time, and maybe Don, I would like to ask Mr. Gardner, if, if, if we have open units in this old development, why do we build new ones? I, I, if that is correct, and maybe at one point in time, and I'm not sure if you're the person to ask these what? questions. We, 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 hear about, we hear about the schools, we hear about the trucks, we hear about the streets. Yeah. Uh, why do we need more apartments? Well, he's running. So um, I'm right. sure Mr. Gardner wouldn't be interested in building yeah. more if he didn't think that. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's a fair question. If, if you allow us to I don't our, you. Go on. complete our presentation, it's a fair question, and perhaps I'll have one of the gardeners uh, respond to it. But I understand the concern. Okay. Uh, again, they're, they're businessmen, successful businessmen. They, they don't do this. Show me two houses. You show me two houses. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope you're enjoying them. Uh, unless the board or council has objection, we'd like to move on to our next witness, which would be Mr. Redding, who is our fiscal expert. So we can get to the school children issue and, and the dollars. So we're going to have Mr. Redding come forward. Thank you, Mr. Okay, good evening. My name is uh, Richard Redding. I've also been here before. It was back in uh, May of last year. <laughs> <clears throat> As you've heard tonight, what we've considered were three alternatives. One was all residential, one was all commercial, and then there was kind of the middle of the road one, which was a mixed-use development, which is the one that we really spent the most time evaluating. <clears throat> and our evaluation was, was fairly detailed in that one. It was like about a 50-page report um, that utilized a, a methodology that's been developed by the Center for Urban Policy Research. Um, and we went through the, the entire fiscal analysis uh, utilizing the information obtained from the township and from the Board of Ed as the uh, fiscal base for the town and then using an input-output model to measure the impact of, of the new development. As you've heard, the, the, the mixed-use model <clears throat> or mixed-use alternative has a total of 175 uh, housing units uh, plus 8,700 square feet of commercial or retail space. Um, of those, 148 units uh, will be market units, and they're comprised of roughly one-third one-bedroom uh, and two-third two-bedroom, so 49 one-bedroom and 99 two-bedroom. Um, the affordable units are distributed pursuant to what they call UHAC, uh, which means you have a mixture of one, two, and three-bedroom units on the affordable units. My study was done back uh, a little while ago, back in April of 2015. Actually, it was done just a few days after the Supreme Court decision, and it was also done before this applicant was an intervener uh, in, this, in this matter. Nevertheless, the alternatives that were presented back over a year ago, or nearly a year ago, always included affordable housing as a component of the development. So it's been part of the plans from the outset, and it, it, my analysis is not structured on uh, that being the necessity for the development, but rather that this development would be able to support an affordable housing component. The, the analysis that we, we completed was showed that if the, the mixed-use uh, alternative was developed, it would have about 15 employees in that little retail center and 362 residents. Um, also then on the school side, we use what we call the demographic multipliers they're published uh, by the Center for Urban Policy Research in 2006. And there are separate multipliers for the market units and, and for the affordable uh, units. For example, the 148 market units using standard statewide demographic multipliers will generate 13 school children. The 27 affordable units, on the other hand, will generate 18. So they would actually generate the bulk of the students will actually come out of the affordable housing units. Um, those numbers uh, amount to about uh, 0.17 students per unit. And interestingly enough, we, we looked at Warren Heights, which has uh, 414 units, and those 414 units um, have 53 students, or 0.128. So actually, the actual is a number is lower than the number that I used uh, in our analysis. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Wayne, how many units was that? 414? 414. 
Um, I'd have to get a hold of Mr. Mr. Ritter actually provided that information. Yeah, we just just well, it was it was done as a review of his yes. original report. We actually got contact the school district mm -hmm. and got their actual projections, what they were getting out of there in terms of school kids, and we found, and quite frankly, the the school district itself didn't believe that it would be that low until they got the numbers for us. Uh, it actually came out lower than what the state projections would have yes. yielded for this type of development. Um, and that was just recently? Well, it, it, was, was, it was in your report of August. Yeah, it was, August, in, it was in our August 18th report of, yes. of uh, 2015. And, and uh, I don't know if they're the same mix as they're proposing here, like the 414. I don't know what the federal mix is on there. No, uh, I don't think we had an absolute mix on that either because the school district couldn't tell us what that was. Yeah, it was oh, saying they, they couldn't break it down by grade. Right. Price, they couldn't wipe it on my bedroom. Uh, and I don't know what the prices are. But just as an example, what you have in this town, you, you, you know, you're not going to get uh, out, out of one and two bedroom uh, apartments uh, uh, two, two students per unit. It just doesn't happen. I think about a one bedroom unit. Who, it wants to live in a one-bedroom unit with a school travel or or, multi, or several schools over. In fact, your, your health officer may not even allow that. So, um, these are numbers that are that are that are, that are traditional for the industry. The important thing in all this is going through is is this a project that will cost the township money or will it, it, it cover its own expenses? And and that was really the, the focus of our analysis. And we looked at it. For the mixed-use development, we also looked at it if, if you went in the other directions, which were the all commercial or the all residential. Using standard analysis here, the market units would generate cost, total cost, municipal, school, county, about $282,000. They would be offset by $741,000 in revenues for a surplus of $459,000. Now, on the other hand, the affordable units, we only generate $79,000 in revenues and $212,000 in costs, so they'd have a deficit of $132,000. But the important thing here is that this project works like the affordable housing <coughs> is always intended to, that the incoming rateable pays for the, the, the development of the affordable units and, importantly, provides enough revenues to offset the cost. So the, there's a surplus overall of about $326,000. What that means is the township doesn't have to build the affordable units, nor do the residents and taxpayers of Lopacon have to pay for the, for the deficits that are, that are caused by those units. So it's, 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 it's the way the project is supposed to work. And we went through and, and tried, tried to explain a couple of uh, reasons why, and we, we did a, a comparison um, of the, not only to the other units, but in, in Lopacon, you have about $561,000 of assessments for every student. This project, when it comes in, for every student it brings in, will bring in $1.9 million, or about three and a half times your average. So what it is, is that in the township, um, you have a lot of single family homes, and that your per student valuation in the single family homes is much lower than it is in a multifamily apartment. So, it may not be hard, and you may not understand it, but if you if you have ten uh, apartment units and generate uh, uh, a fractional child, it's, it's a much higher value than a single family home with one or two children. So the ratio here of this project is is 1.9 million versus 560 thousand, and that's that's why we show a surplus um, on on the school side. We went through it and did that also for the two other alternatives. You typically think that your non-residential alternative is, is the, the best fiscal alternative because you don't have any school children or any school costs. But what, what happens is that in, in current market conditions, that non-residential rateable isn't really all that value. That if you develop the site for 90,000, 90,500 square feet of retail space, you'd have about an $11 million value. The mixed use development is a thirty-two uh, is a twenty-nine million dollar value, and the all residential is actually a thirty-two million dollar value. But you say, well, but yeah, the 
the all retail use doesn't have any it doesn't have any school costs. And you're right, it doesn't. But because the, the valuation is so much lower, when you get to the bottom line, the surplus on, on, on the all commercial uh, uh, project is 240000 compared to the mixed use of 326000 because you start with a higher valuation. So even though you have more expenses, uh, you have a lot more revenue to work with. So um, of the three, obviously the all residential, which is the um, 199 unit thing would probably generate the most revenues, but it's, I don't think it's the one that, at least with my initial uh, presentation, was the one that the township was looking forward to, which uh, was really the mixed use development. And that one is the one that overall, and even with the inclusion, uh, or notwithstanding the inclusion of the affordable units, would be expected to generate an annual revenue surplus of $326,000. So. Um, from that standpoint, it, it's not a drain on the township. It would, uh, it would it would cover all of its costs, cover the cost of the affordable units, and still generate a little surplus. I think that's all I had to say. You'll have, you'll have to ask Mr. Larkin. I, I can't I can't speculate on that. I can actually respond to that, and if you'd like to hear directly from uh, Mr. Larkin, you certainly can. I actually ask the client the question. Those units are not sold because it's just the, the function of the market. So because they were built enough, they were offered for rent. And to the uh, question earlier about having, uh, you know, why do we need more rental units, in the, in the rental mode that we're in right now for those units that you're referring to, we have three vacancies. That's an extremely low vacancy rate. So to your question, uh, the rental market seems to be fairly strong. This one has a base on 100% accuracy, right? Correct. Correct. Now, uh, is there a percentage uh, percentage, uh, percentage that won't be rented? It would, that would be something that, that I did not do in here. <laughs> it would make the analysis more attractive. What typically in, in rental projects, if you do um, do capitalization analysis, you, you assume a five percent vacancy. So now, even if those units, a five percent of the units are vacant, which means they don't have people and they don't school kids, you're still paying taxes. So you're still getting the revenues, but you wouldn't have the cost. So um, yes, you're right. There's typically a five percent vacancy. No, I didn't. I didn't adjust for that. Just, just so you understand, when it's tax assessor, assesses and market contract, let's presume this is 200 units. It assesses it based upon what it believes its fair market value is as a whole. And his number was 30, uh, 35 million or someplace. 29 million. Thank 30, you. 39 million. And so they assess it as 39 million. It's taxed on an assessment of 39 million dollars. That probably assumes pretty much full occupancy. If the assessor is doing his job, he'll build in, he'll figure that out on a capitalization method, as Mr. Renning had said, and he'll use a 5% vacancy factor, which is fairly standard across the state. Um, um, and they're going to value. The owner of the complex will pay the same tax whether he has them all rented or he has a 20% vacancy. He may file a tax appeal and claim that his assessment's too high, but he pays the taxes basically no matter what the assessment is, no matter what the occupancy rate is. So it's yeah. not, you don't pay per tenant that occupies it, you pay on the total value of the complex. So you, you mentioned the third concept that actually, we ne I, don't, I don't think we've ever seen, which is the all commercial concept. Which is that 90,000 square feet? You, and I, and I don't show that, that we've ever, not to my knowledge, ever seen that. <coughs> this, this is the first, actually, I'm not really even hearing that that's even on the table. If I could just that. that was a question that the board asked. I've done a lot of commercial developments here, all of which is joint. So I took the percentage of the allowable and earliest coverage, I looked at the building, and I determined that, in my opinion, if the 16.6 acres were to know, it would yield 90,500 square feet based on 0.125 per square foot. I also then said, 
uh, my client's not at all interested in doing that type of development. So the board asked, are you going to do a layout? And I said, no. <laughs> uh, well, it was just that it was, it was brought up and it was a cost factor. It was, it, was, it was one of the three alternatives I, I included. At, it's not an alternative. No, it was, it was a com one of the three comparisons that I did. There's another one that's also not shown, which is 199 all residential units. And that, that, the, I have a that's our, our next witness is our traffic okay, engineer. <laughs> Always one step ahead. <laughs> question. Sure. Um, you were you were talking about how much money this will generate for the town versus the expense. You made this seem like a pretty good rateable, um, bigger than I've ever seen for a residential apartment complex or rental. Are those numbers comparable to one of our other rental developments that we have? Can we back up your your numbers with an example in our town? Um, there was a, there was a uh, I, I have not done a comparison to, to any other project, but there was there was evaluation analysis that was included in the report on the basis of that and and how we got to it. It was based on on the um, anticipated rent uh, of, of the units and the capitalization of those rents. Uh, for example, on on the commercial, we had a ten dollar gross rent on, on that. Uh, on the residential units, we had. We had monthly rents from 1,250 on the one bedroom, to 1,550 on the two bedrooms, um, and then we had the affordable rents at, uh, as required. So it, it's a capital, it's a capitalized uh, valuation, and uh, 29 million dollars for the unit. I mean, overall, we're talking about a, a per unit value of about 163,000. <laughs> so I, I don't know if, if that's uh, I'm lying. that that is the valuation. Um, the pack kind of is basically at a hundred percent assessment ratio, so the assessment and the value are the same. Okay, I think I think it might be worthwhile to to take a look at that because I have never seen uh, anything residential be described as a good rateable ever in my, oh, in well, my this, career. This is, it's, a, a, um, this is not a question of good rateable; it's a question of how much an assessor, what value an assessor would place on on this type of a new development. These numbers can probably, and I know the township has a new assessor, can probably, if board, planning board and council is interested, could do a pro forma workup of, of these type of things, assuming once they know the basic rentals of what they're going to be, what the mix is going to be, there are formulas for expenses for these types of development. They are um, the cap rate. I don't know what cap rate Mr. Redding used, but there's... Um, I just last year tried a case, a uh, tax appeal case over in Phillipsburg, in which uh, the court set a cap rate. I presume the cap rate would be about the same for the back on in Phillipsburg because of given the area and so forth. Uh, remember, the the higher the cap rate, the lower the, the, the value of the assessment and vice versa. So uh, I don't know what cap rate he used. I know what cap rate the, the court put on as a base cap rate. Uh, but um, these things can be calculated as to what this property will probably be assessed at with a fair degree of accuracy. So can we have our assessor? Uh, assessor could definitely do a pro okay. forma assessment based upon 175 and 200 units and 8,700 feet of commercial. I think that would be our due diligence. That's that, 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 that could definitely be uh, calculated uh, by an assessor. Okay. Any further questions? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This is our traffic engineer. Well, we put your traffic engineer on. Yeah. <clears throat> I see where some, some people went in out. I'd like to take a five minute break. Absolutely. And then we'll resume when we, we come back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The traffic and transportation planning experience throughout New Jersey. I've prepared over 500 traffic impact studies. I've testified in over 100 municipalities on over 500 applications. The other thing is, as far as uh, this property would require a DOT access permit, I'm very familiar with that process, having processed over 300 access permits for various uh, projects from residential to commercial for, for the board's benefit. And I've also been qualified by New Jersey Superior Court as a traffic expert on three land use matters.
more than qualified. Okay. All right, <laughs> just for the board's benefit. I'm really going to just be t uh, keep it short and just really focus on two topics. The first will be access, as was uh, previously uh, testified by some of the other restaurants, uh, restaurants uh, witnesses. <laughs> I'm hungry, yes, it's been a while. <laughs> Uh, right. Uh, Larkin Group are, is committed to knowing that they have, can have access to Route 57, that we'll have it as a right in, right out, with no left turns. And that's predicated on the fact that we also have alternate access to Baltimore, and we're, the concept plan showed interconnections to the other commercial properties. So this site, as it sits, has uh, great access to both state highways and local roadways. Um, so um, as far as DOT and getting that permitted, I don't see any issues with that, and specifically if we go as a right-in, right-out. But the, the more important aspect of this is from a traffic generation standpoint, and when you compare what's permitted, um, as Mr. Heibel had testified, that this property by zoning could accommodate approximately 90,500 square feet of retail space, and then we have two other proposals. And I'll just briefly touch on um, peak hour trip generation so you can see the comparison of the different scenarios from what's permitted versus the two residential proposals. During a weekday morning period, as, as of right, a retail center would generate approximately 150 peak hour trips during the morning, whereas 199 apartments would be just over 100 trips. And the mixed-use development would generate approximately 124 trips, generally lower than what the retail. But then when you look at the PM and the Saturday peak hours, which are really the highest uh, traffic generation time periods for retail, during a weekday PM peak hour, a development of 90,000 plus square feet would generate 560 trips during the one peak hour, whereas 199 apartments would be 123 trips, and then the mixed-use proposal would be 226 trips, so obviously significantly lower than a retail development. And then I'll touch on the Saturday peak hour. Uh, a retail development of 90,000 square feet could generate approximately 820 peak hour trips, whereas 199 apartments would be just over 100 or 104 trips, and then uh, the mixed-use would be 270 trips. So as you can see from a traffic generation standpoint, uh, a residential proposal would be significantly less than the retail. And, and the same is true when you look at it from a daily perspective. So um, uh, again, the important thing is here is that there's uh, great access to this property given the fact that we have uh, frontage on the state highway and the local roadway and the interconnections. And as a residential development, it would generate significantly less traffic than as is permitted by current zoning. We had uh, one of the original presentations we consider the all residential we also are considering having no access to 57 in that scenario what would a recommendation be there well I mean as, as far as on the residential proposals I mean given the, the amount of traffic to be generated I mean as, as 199 apartments solely just residential um, just by my observations, the area roadways in, in, in Baltimore would be more than adequate to accommodate that. Uh, but as far as a mixed use proposal, uh, you know, the, the retail unit uh, use is going to be uh, having traffic not only from internally right. in the local, but it also feeds off Route 57. So for, for a retail site to be viable, uh, it's my opinion that you at least have to have at least a right in, right out access onto 57. That's what was one of our problems. How would we really control the right in, right out? It, 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 it is difficult. Yeah. Uh, you can go with uh, channelized islands, but when you have an undivided roadway, it's an enforcement issue. Yes, I agree with you. Okay. Any other further? I do. I just want to define a trip is back and forth? A trip is one car it's a movement in okay um so it's not back and forth it's just just one, one. correct uh, i have a question too yes so um a lot of people aren't working right so 199 units are only generating 104 trips that means 100 that means 102 
for the 60 minute period. It doesn't mean that. Okay, so that's that's for you. Okay. Correct. It's for a 60 minute period. It's when we do a traffic analysis, we focus on a 60 minute period. It doesn't mean that there's got, and that peak hour could be 7:30 to 8:30, 7 to 8, but doesn't mean that people aren't leaving before 7 o'clock or leaving closer to 9. Uh, so that doesn't represent traffic all day long. That's just for a 60 minute period. In, in the in and out on, on 57, that's just a stop sign thing, kind of a? That would be a, a stop sign, correct. Okay. There's not uh, enough traffic uh, volume to warrant a traffic signal. Uh, and that be subject to NJDOT requirements. And 99% of the times, NJDOT will not approve a traffic signal for a um, private use. There is the exception, Phillipsburg Mall has, but that's again, that's a major traffic generator. We just have a traffic signal like a couple of feet up, right? Correct. And that's what works well with this site. There's the alternate access provides to Baltimore than to Stryker. So the people do have a means to use the traffic signal to do left turns. Uh, so that, that infrastructure is already in place. Their existing counts were pretty current that you used to run the analysis? We didn't do traffic counts. There would once a site plan application is uh, prepared, then there will be current traffic counts done in a formal, detailed traffic analysis. My evaluation was just on a traffic generation perspective of what's permitted versus what's being proposed. Does Larkin control all those adjacent properties that those driveways are going out to? That's my understanding. But I'll yeah. defer to uh, so, the, so the residential cutting through commercial areas that's is a possibility. Yes. The access you see to the commercial area is uh, to Larkin's property. Whereas that's really for interconnectivity, so that you don't have people on public roads, but the likelihood of people using as a cut through, uh, it's, that's definitely possible. But it, but it's again, it's limited to whatever is generated by the site itself. It's not a through. Tr someone's not going to come off Baltimore, come through the site, and go through those other. Yeah. I would hope, <laughs> unless they have nothing else better to do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. That's our our last uh, witness. Okay. If there's no other uh, questions from. Uh, uh, any comparison to the uh, the Pecan master plan and how the residential and commercial growth is or is not in compliance with master plan? I I know that uh, along the way, you know, like I've said in my introduction, I've been at this for about a year. I, I know that your planner, Mr. Ritter, had prepared a report at the at the planning board. Oh, yeah. I didn't see that. One. Yeah. So there is something from your own consultant in terms of the compatibility, okay. and, yeah, which you might want to take a look at. Okay. One of the uh, factors that you guys are well know is the fact that we're required to conform, substantially conform with the Highlands Regional Master Plan. They're in the process of now of reviewing their master plan, and hopefully it will be out here shortly, so we know what we have to try to conform to. The other thing is this would also be subject to approval by the Highlands Council. Oh. So there's a little process to go through here. Okay. Just for your own knowledge, I would right. say, is that this board cannot mm -hmm. grant the variance outright without doing a review of the master plan. So. Does our plan have an opinion in regards to the property? I'm sorry. What? Do you have any opinions? Any? Well, we put together a report that goes into the, for lack of a better term, the pros and cons of, of basically what they are proposing mm -hmm. as compared to what is there. Okay. In other words, what how it's zoned. Uh, the report itself, uh, quite frankly, found that the site plan itself, in terms of the uses they're proposing are compatible with the neighborhood. That doesn't mean that the commercial was incompatible or it ought to be changed, but we feel that it that it does fit within the fabric of that neighborhood if the board felt that it was an appropriate way to go. Uh, but the report itself does address the different aspects, the pros and cons of it. Uh, it looks at 
uh, sewer usage, water usage. It looks at how it would fit within the fabric of that neighborhood. We, we did not make a recommendation to go and change the zoning. What we did find, and, and I feel, that the apartments in that area are not incompatible with what's out there. If the board concludes that it wants to change the zoning and, and basically reduce the amount of commercial zoning in that portion of the town, uh, it, it does fit within that fabric. And that's basically what the reports are. Uh, but you, you should take a look at it. There's more in the report than just land use compatibility. Um, we'll certainly take a look at it. Can I uh, clarify one thing, Drew? The, the board can't change anything. Board can make a recommendation. Only the council can change the zoning. It's done by ordinance. Um, the board can issue some variances. The land use variance is not one of the variances that can be issued by this board. So we're here purely to listen perhaps make a recommendation, but the council will decide. Again, thank you for, for hearing us. Uh, when, when we're here in November, it was uh, the, the council's recommendation that we have this meeting, and we're, we're happy to accomplish that. Again, we, we'd like you to keep this in mind in terms of a straight up zoning, but we, we do know this has implications for your affordable housing, and we're gonna keep working with Mr. Cohn and the court master toward that end as well. So, um, but we would uh, we would like to keep this ball rolling. So, we'd like you to keep it in, in the forefront. And um, you know, the, the, the simple request is for a rezoning. So, at some point in time, the council needs to, you know, make a decision. We know that's not going to happen tonight. And we know it's a process, but that's what we're seeking. So, you know, through through the normal process and or through the, the settlement process or hopefully not a litigation process, that's where we're trying to get to. And with that, I thank you again. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to open it up to uh, public comment now. Would you be willing to entertain questions from the public? Sure. Uh, is there anyone that has any questions or comments on the presentation this evening or media information? Ms. Well, this is really a question more for one of our professionals, and it might be, I just don't know, so it's probably a silly question, but um, when we look at our um, requirements for COA units in the township, can existing complexes that already exist in the township increase the number of COA units to meet any gaps that might be determined that we have? Instead of like building another complex, can Sycamore Landing increase the number of their COA units or Warren Heights increase their number or the Brakeley Apartments increase whatever to well, meet any gap? They, I guess the answer to that is they could, but, the, but the, the key thing is they would have to structure any increase in those units so that they conform to core regulations mm -hmm. and have the deed restrictions right. put on them. Right. Uh, that's something that most people don't normally okay. want to do, but the answer is sure, they could if they wish to. Okay, That's thank you. The practical problem with that mm -hmm. is, let's say we go to Larkin and say, we want you to increase the Warren Heights and put it. What's the incentive for that? Right. A builder, the whole idea behind the builder's remedy and the builder's doing this, is again, as I said, they don't do it at the goodness of the That's right. It's they have to get a higher density, and this is what the builders are doing. If you can prove to us that uh, that the area will be compatible for higher density, you're entitled to a higher density in order to offset the loss that it, you, the builder is going to build the building and affordable house. Mm -hmm. So we could go to all the existing apartment complexes in the town and say, "Are you are you interested in putting in additional affordable housing? You don't get any more units." You just build affordable housing for the town and then, uh, yeah, I guess that really wouldn't make sense unless it was a situation maybe where there are units sitting empty anyway. So maybe if they came, I mean, I, I really don't know, but I'm just, well, I'm trying to see if there's any option other than building new building in the event that there's a gap. Theoretically, you are right as a practical matter. That may not make sense. Yeah, well, yeah, there's also other ways to meet your obligation. Uh, in a, uh, building, building units is one way to do mm -hmm. it. 
you could have you could pass an ordinance that allowed accessory apartments to be added to existing homes as long as they were affordable. Okay. You could uh, support group homes, uh, basically in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's other other th other means. I think that's what I'm trying to get to. Uh, like, what other means might there be? Just so you understand, that there's there's another means, which most people don't even consider, but some municipalities in New Jersey have. The township can take general tax revenue, go out for a bonding uh, issue, and build, build four Yes, thousand. build their own, if right. If you need 50 units, you can go out and build a complex of 50 units. Uh, it probably would make sense to get a rental because you get additional tax, mm -hmm. and, and you would handle that. You would set up an apartment of uh, oh, housing, yes. and <clears> they, <throat> they, they, they would do the rental. There are some municipalities that have done that. Yeah. And they've done a fiscal analysis to say, you know what? Uh, that could be the cheapest thing in the long run. So it isn't that you just have to meet, the township has to meet, it's a reasonable opportunity. The township wants to go out and build affordable housing, mm -hmm. then they've met it. And if mm -hmm. the builder probably isn't going to be successful. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, it's an interesting option and maybe a good Samaritan kind of thing too. Thanks. So, but just so you know, that that's available. Mm -hmm. Most municipalities don't go for that, mm -hmm. but it is available. So, oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Grudemeyer. I live uh, not too far from this proposed development. Just want to give my uh, thoughts on what I'm going to walk home with tonight after seeing it was a very thorough presentation. Um, one word, excessive, right? Um, 200 unit proposal when there's possibly 100 units next door, not sold, maybe rented, totally get it. Um, seems like there's space there. The rental space, while conceptually it's nice, I drive up Strikers Road, there's empty rental places there. We all know that there's empty places in the mall. I'm not sure we need more retail space, but that's my thoughts. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Anyone else? Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I just had two traffic questions. Um, on, the, on the drawing, you had cut through from, from the property, cutting through Larkin's company on commercial property. <coughs> Um, which then leads out, I think, one might lead out to Baltimore or the other to Stryker. What would happen if Stryker sold his commercial property in the future? And, and the new owner would say, I don't want cut through. Can, could that happen? Could the new owner say, I don't want these cut through with my property anymore? I would imagine it runs with the deed. I mean, there, they'll have to they be. They would establish it, uh, an access easement, an ingress and egress easement, which would run with the land. Which would be part of the site plan application to perfect that. And then my last question on it is um, the traffic study. Was there a traffic study done on the intersection of Baltimore and Stryker? No, there were no traffic counts done as part of this. The, this, the exercise is really to, to present information as to how much traffic the site would generate based on the, the different land use proposals. Uh, uh, once a land use proposal is determined, then we'll go out and do data collection, do a formal detailed traffic study for those locations that would be impacted by the development. That's already a very busy intersection. There's only a stop sign there. And it's already good. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Anyone else? Public comment on any other things that are occurred <clears throat> for this evening? If not, uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, motion. Second. <coughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. So ordered.